Hello and welcome to this session of Philosophical Screens, a quarterly salon hosted by the BFI in which a group of philosophers, film scholars and cinephiles gather together to discuss one of the current season's films. Ordinarily, these events take place in person, but unfortunately, on this occasion, the pandemic has forced us online. Nonetheless, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Lucy Bolton, reader in film studies at Queen Mary University of London, and Dr. Victor Fan, reader in film and media philosophy at King's College London, to talk about Itami Juzo's gloriously eclectic film, Tampopo. I'm Catherine Wheatley. I'm a reader in film and visual culture at King's College London, and I'll be chairing today's conversation. We'll be following the usual philosophical screens format. Each of our presenters will speak for about five to 10 minutes uh, regarding the film, offering a philosophically inflected take on its themes and form. And then we'll move into a more general chat. Now, usually this would be enriched by comments from the attendees. For today, we'll just have to manage amongst ourselves, but I'm sure we'll have plenty to say about this very provocative film. I believe Lucy is gonna kick us off. So Lucy, over to you. Thanks very much, Kate. It's fantastic to be able to do this, even though we had to cancel um, on the day itself. So it's wonderful to be able to talk about this, um, yes, unique film, this ramen western, this uh, noodle comedy, it's variously described. And so many people seem to have it as one of their favourite films. Um, I was listening to a podcast on it last night where it was talking about it being a fantastic comedy, 100% brilliant comedy. Uh, but any film about food, I would suggest, always has the potential to veer into more transgressive or difficult territory. And I would suggest into the realms of disgust, disgust and repulsion. So I'm starting from quite a strong perspective here, whether that's from um, people's attitude or gluttony towards food or uh, repulsion at the means by which food is made, for example, what food is made of, or, um, or what, what the ingredients are, or how it's eaten, how it's consumed. There are lots of ways in which showing people relating to food can be really disgusting. And there are specific features, I think, of Tampopo um, towards food, which are really, really interesting, very clever and, um, and very double-edged. There's a reverence and a respect for food, quite clearly. There's that re wonderful sequence where uh, Gunn, I think it is, is reading from the book about the, the master, the ramen master, who talks about how you, the order in which you should approach your bowl of ramen and how you should pay deference to it. So there's reverence and respect, but there's also the opposite. There's disrespect. Um, like when one of the noodles is flicked at the face of, um, of, of one of the guys in the, in the noodle bar or, or abuse, even abuse of food um, and abuse, certainly abuse of the ingredients that go into the food, as well as I would say the film having an obsession with the boundaries between inside and outside um, uh, our relationship to food, to fluids, to solids, uh, through our bodies, through sexuality, through our desires um, for, for food and relationships, but also very importantly, it seems to me at a social level. And so Tampopo seems to be able to operate all these fascinating boundaries on many, many levels. Uh, going back to the idea of transgression, it seems to me that lots of the little vignettes around the main story, some of which I think are absolutely fantastic, um, really poke fun at us, poke fun at human beings whether it's not knowing our way around a menu in a foreign language, like the French menu, when essentially everyone picks saumonier and a beer, a Heineken um, and a consomme, um, except the most junior chap who, he, despite being kicked under the table, is able to reveal his expertise in not only having visited the restaurant in Paris, but choosing an exquisite selection from the menu, to, which impresses the waiter so much, but the, the pretense and ostentatiousness and hierarchy that's pierced in that sequence is absolutely wonderful. Or there's the idea of etiquette. So outside that, that private dining room, there's the lady trying to teach young ladies how to eat spaghetti um, and tapping into this wonderful idea of the slurp and slurping and whether or not it's acceptable to slurp up your spaghetti in the way that it is to slurp noodles or indeed uh, the desperation to eat your dumplings, um, even when you're stricken with a gangrenous 
um, tooth abscess, like the chap on the train, um, where his pain, I think, is quite brilliantly evoked by the clattering on the railway lines of, the, of this train, the sort of the, the wrangling in his head of the pain. Now, and when he gets, he still tries to eat his dumplings, though, even though it's agony. And when he gets his his tooth sorted, he gets his abscess sorted. The dentist are, and the dentist staff are absolutely repulsed by the, the smell. Like they have to throw open the window and stick their heads out of, of the window. Now these sequences, I mean, loads more of them. They they poke fun at I think at human beings and how we are about food, our obsessions with food. But they also dip in and out and further in to the idea of repulsion and disgust. And that's what I find most philosophically interesting about this film. So I say the dentist and the nurses are repulsed by the smell. They do, are repulsed, but they're not disgusted. They, they, they throw open the window because the smell is so bad, but they're interested to talk to him about it and say, Didn't, couldn't you smell it? You know, it's their job, so they're not that repulsed, they're not that disgusted by it. So for me, there are different levels of repulsion and disgust in the film. There's mild disgust, which we might say is at the slurping. Now, it's the very cinematic creation of that slurping scene where it's exaggerated and repeated and very loud and focused on. So there's the slurping. There's perhaps the globules of fat on the top of the ramen when first pointed out. Um, certainly in relation to the ingredients that go into the ramen, some of the chicken feet and the chicken heads and things like that, and some of the bones and things don't look all that nice. And there's a discussion of smells of the ingredients and them having been cooked for too long or things like that. So there's that kind of mild level of maybe even distaste, we might say. Then there's quite moderate, quite strong, but moderate repulsion. Um, I actually find the famous supposedly erotic egg yolk scene really repulsive because A, I hate egg yolks, but also, I mean, it actually makes me feel ill even to think about it. And I found it very hard to watch because in terms of the cleverness of the way in which the film presents it, it's bound up with a tension so for me, it was far more about tension of when is that awful egg yolk going to burst rather than the erotic passing of the egg yolk from one mouth to another. And then there's actually severe repulsion and disgust, such as the pig's head in the kitchen, which makes Tampopo faint, such as the crayfish torture in the scene where the gangster puts the live crustaceans on his lover's stomach. Um, and the killing of the beautiful soft shell turtle. Now, I find that scene incredibly upsetting. Again, it's the way it's shot, the way each of those scenes are put together. There's a moment where the turtle bucks a little as if trying to escape, but the chef flips it over and kills it. Now, I find that very, very difficult to watch. And that engenders not only in me, repulsion at the sight of these things, but also the sound and also the thought of it and also um, what I'm seeing. Now, thinking about those in relation to a philosophy of disgust, the philosophy of disgust, which is about, let's face it, disgust is a strong, visceral emotion. It's a fascinating field, I think, um, philosophy of disgust. It's founded in so many ways on the senses, taste, smell, perhaps touch, but here, because we're watching a film and listening to a film, unusually, we're also really focusing on sight and sound in, in the field of, of disgust. So linking the philosophy of disgust with film, with this film in particular, really highlights the phenomenology of the film or the effective power of film, such as the egg yolk scene, for example. We've got not only um, the sight of it, but also the time of it, the experience of it, this, this passing, this waiting for it to burst, this, um, and the gangrenous tooth perhaps, and, 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 the, and the stink, that is um, interesting because, as I say, it's repulsive, but it's not actually disgusting to those in that room, which leads me to 
consider an ethics of disgust. So the philosophy of disgust, we can think about it as aesthetics, what things look like and how they're presented and how we experience them, but also an ethics of disgust. And this is what I think I find most interesting about the film. So when the pig head is presented to Tempopo and she faints, that seems to be an appropriate response to the pig head. So I see it, I'm upset by it, I'm upset by the eyes, I'm upset by the, the look of it. Um, but I kind of think, yes, of course she'd faint, it's, it's awful. She does then apologize and as she apologizes a lot actually, but she apologizes and, and, and it carries on. But that seems an appropriate response. So though I find it upsetting, I'm far more, far more upset by the killing of the turtle because a, we're seeing the turtle being killed, but also they all just watch out of interest. Um, they all just look at the turtle being killed, this hideous spectacle, and I judge them for that. So although I'm, I approve of Tampopo fainting at the pig head, I judge her for being able to watch and maintain the view and then eating this, this soft shell turtle. So, the film very cleverly, I think, makes this point over and over again, that we may be ostentatious or um, ignorant about food, and we kill and abuse animals for our culinary pleasures, but we too are those animals. And I think this is the brilliant book ending of the film. When the wise man that I mentioned earlier, the wise man from the book that Gunn reads um, in the opening sequence says that we need to acknowledge the pork. You know, it sounds ridiculous and we laugh, but I found it actually quite moving because he's saying, you know, the gestalt of the ramen, um, he's stating clearly at the outset that we are all flesh and we need to respect the slices of pork in our ramen, acknowledging that we will all end up in the same place. He says something like, knowing that we will see it again one day. So the film then goes on to show our, our ridiculous, precious, perverse, and our re relationship with food. And of course ends with this extreme sustained close up on a baby feeding at its mother's breast, really to drive home the point that we are as, um, uh, as implicate, Im, Im, what's the word? Uh, implicated in the um, devouring and uh, slurping and abuse and enjoyment as much as any other animal. So ultimately the film in a way poses, we might think, a kind of paradox of repulsion. Why do so many people seem to love this film, which has so many repulsive elements to it? Um, there's loads more to say, but uh, I'll stop there and hand over to uh, Catherine, I think, is going to come next. Thank you, Lucy. I've been furiously making notes, you've probably been able to see, and uh, if you'll pardon the pun, I think that's given me plenty of food for thought. Um, and I wanted to start my discussion of, uh, or my, dis my section of the discussion, uh, with that scene of Gunn, uh, played by Ken Watanabe, uh, and the old noodle master. So the sort of the, the start of the film in many ways. Um, and I don't find this film revolting, far from it. I mean, I've seen it quite a few times and it always makes me hungry. I was watching it at my desk yesterday with a banana and it felt not up to the task. Uh, but at the same time, I do find it a little bit distasteful. Uh, I want to say icky, that well-known philosophical term. Um, and the reason for my sense of ickiness, I think, is that the descriptions of the eating process have what I perceive as a very sexual undertone. The old master lustily describes the jewels of fat floating on the bowl service, the roast pork, which is modestly half submerged. He tells Gunn that he must express affection to the ramen, nudge it lovingly, nestle his chopsticks in the broth, and finally apologize for having consumed it and bid it farewell until we meet again. So my reading of that scene and uh, my feeling about that scene is much more metaphorical, I think, than yours, Lucy. Um, and my reading of the place of food in general may be much more metaphorical because I can't help he but hear suggestions of seduction and, and abandonment in this address to the soup. 
which has for me connotations of kind of coy femininity, that kind of modest nestling and questing masculinity with the probing chopsticks. And it's quite obvious, I think, that throughout Tampopo, there's a connection between food and sex, notably in the sequence that you have just so vividly described, and which Itami himself refers to as pornography of the edible. Also in the repeated associations of certain foodstuffs like lobsters and oysters and conchas and ice creams, quite troublingly, and carrots, and of course, peaches uh, with sex organs. These foodstuffs are dripping and dribbling. They're ripe to the point of bursting. They're very much the kind of stuff of life. And in many ways, this is really joyous and celebratory. And I think we could arguably connect the careful attention that the film pays to the variety of foodstuffs it shows us as enacting what both the French philosopher Sandra Logier and the Japanese philosopher Yuriko Saito have described as the care of everyday objects. Food nourishes us and it provides us with pleasure. So isn't it only right and proper that we should acknowledge the vital role that it plays in our everyday lives? But, there's always a but, at the same time, I am struck by how gendered the association of food and sex is in Tampopo. Um, there are kind of very comically strategically placed wine bottles and sputtering frothing beers, which serve as phallic substitutes, while the men sort of lifting their bowls and slurping greedily from them has, for me, sort of yonic symbolization. And women, on the other hand, hardly ever eat. And when they do, they're coached to eat silently, not to slurp. What they do is that they serve. There's the geisha who drives her elderly patron to restaurants, the gangster's girlfriend whose body acts as a kind of living plate, the impoverished mother who in a really sad sequence, you know, her devotion to feeding her family is so all consuming that it literally kills her. And of course, Tampopo herself. And Tampopo, um, a word which means dandelion, a wispy, fragile thing that can disappear with a puff of air, shares her name with the film. So it's her journey that, that's at the center of the film. It's her transformation that we watch. And I wondered as Lucy was talking whether we might see her in many ways as the film's moral core. She faints at the sight of the pig's head. I think she does actually flinch momentarily when she first sees the turtle presented to her. And yet she seems to be hardly there. It's as if she wouldn't exist apart from the men who mould her. And it's very clear from the film's opening that Tampopo is a cook, but she's not a chef. And this is a trope that we sort of know all too well. I mentioned in my introduction to the film, if anyone's watching that was there at the screening, um, Nigella Lawson, who I think is also a specialist in pornography of the edible. Um, but she, alongside Delia Smith and Julia Child and Tana Ramsey, are all presented to the British public or the American public as cooks. Whereas Michelle Roux and Anthony Bourdain and Heston Flumenthal and Gordon Ramsay are all chefs. And here, Itami links female cooking to ideals of female beauty. If Tampopo's food has solid, honest flavor but lacks pizzazz, this is reflected in her middle-aged and frumpy appearance. I'm quoting here from the gang. She is a diamond that needs polishing. They continue, or it continues. Her pork can't be too fat nor too thin, a diet problem that many women know all too well. Her broth can't be too plain or too bold, too hot or too cold. Her noodles must be smooth and silky, but with the right amount of bite, She's like Goldilocks or Cinderella, the epitome of the need for the woman to be just right. Now, there are exceptions to the interdiction on female consumption, and I do find those moments really fascinating. Two of my favorite sequences, um, one of them is a very comical uh, sequence in which uh, we see an elderly woman, very well-dressed in a supermarket, greedily kind of squeezing food stuff, savoring their tactility. Um, there's a beautiful piece to be written, I think, about the kind of phenomenology of Tampopo. And it, all this happens while the cashier is chasing her around with a fly swat, trying to catch her in the act. The second sequence, which I find more uneasy, takes place on a beach. And we see a young lady, almost a child really, offering the gangster an oyster. And at first she seems to cleave to type. Like his lover, she allows him to eat the oyster from her flesh on her naked palm. But then he cuts himself on the lip and she licks the blood at first tentatively and then ravenously. It's almost cannibalistic. And the scene goes nowhere. It's one of those vignettes that just kind of appears and then disappears. 
but there's a pan to a group of young women standing in the water and there's something quite sinister about this group and something quite rebellious about them and I was sort of thinking about mermaids which were originally thought to kind of have rows and rows of teeth and to eat men I think like the old women these these young girls stand in a kind of liminal space they want food but that puts them on the fringes of society within the film and this is the opposite trajectory to Tampopo. At the film's end, she's transformed in one of these glorious makeover sequences into a chef complete with shiny new utensils and pearl earrings and a pristine white chef's hat. And as an aside, I think there's something very interesting about the fact that as she is appearing in this white hat, the predatory gangster's white suit is soaked by rain and stained by mud and blood. And there's a kind of symbolic exchange of whiteness that takes place. And now to Goru, her kind of potential lover, she looks like something out of a French film. She's confident, she's happy, and now, of course, her food is delicious and desirable as well. And she seems to be independent at last. So is this a feminist statement? I find it a bit hard to accept it as such, because in the end, Goru and his team take all the credit. They sit at Tempopo's counter and proclaim, we did it. And the sensei says, well, I never thought a woman could be a great ramen chef, but now I see how wrong I was. You're a superstar and pretty too. That's important. And it's on Goru, not on Tampopo, that the film closes as he disappears back over the horizon. And that's the final shot, a part, of course, for that provocative moment in which we see a baby suckling on his mother's nipple, which might sort of suggest that we're animals, but it also brings about this kind of pseudo-sexual association of, of feeding and breasts. And I'm minded here of another film which turns around food and sex and women, and which features another very politically pointed scene of breastfeeding, and which is to me genuinely disgusting, which is Dusan Makovajev's Sweet Movie. Now, writing about this film, the philosopher Stanley Cavell makes the argument, and I'm back here to the disgusting Lucy, that revulsion, the feeling of revolt, is inherently bound up with revolution. If we're revolted with the world, we find it uninhabitable, and so we're bound to try to change it. There has to be a kind of political valency or an ethical valency to, re to, to revulsion and to revolt. And for Cavell, Sweet Movie demonstrates that the best way to access the world is to find out how it tastes, to find out whether it's to your taste um, and whether it's unpalatable or not. And if it is unpalatable, then what do you mean to do about it? Where does that leave us, really? And I don't think that Tampopi does this. I think, and I think it's for this reason that I find it to be sometimes delightful, sometimes quite icky, but not revolting. I think it flirts with cultural critique, but it's also funny and it's romantic and visually uh, enticing. It leaves me not feeling sickened, but hungry and like I want to go off to a, a noodle bar straight after watching it. And to my Western eyes, none of the many vivid images and metaphors it, it deploys, and there are so many of them, resolve into a coherent critique, either of patriarchy and gender relations or of social convention and etiquette, or of animal consummation, or of capitalism and consumerism. So that's where it leaves me. But I do wonder if Victor might be able to shed more light on the political and historical forces that shape Tampopo. So Victor, perhaps I could hand over now to you. Thank you so much, Lucy and Catherine. And um, I enjoyed hearing your evaluations of Tom Popo so much. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to um, talking to you more about the details of some of the, of, the, uh, of the scenes and also to be able to kind of like um, have some discussion with you about some of these ethical issues because I think they are really, really crucial <clears throat> in kind of retrospectively, re retrospectively rethinking what Itami Zuzo was doing back in the 1980s. Um, Itami Zuzo, of course, the 1980s, I think the big background of this film was uh, Japan's bubble economy and so Japan, was having a very successful uh, economy at the time and also a very successful international status. Um, and um, if we zoom into the film industry situation, however, the film industry was doing extremely bad um, in Japan and um, many filmmakers were not able to get jobs. 
um, with the exception of working in some form of pornography. So this is already one very interesting that Itami Zuzo was trying to make fun of in some ways is to, as Catherine said, to make a pornography, an edible pornography. Um, Itami Zuzo is a very interesting figure and he also came from a very, very interesting um, family. Um, he was a Kansai person, meaning that he actually was from Kyoto instead of from Tokyo. And so in some ways, you can also see that he has a very uneasy relationship with Tokyo in general, like throughout the film. And um, a very important note um, to think about, which is which I really do want to emphasize, is that Itami's, Itami really came from what in Japan at the time would be considered more left-wing um, political family. Now, when I say left-wing, I don't mean that everything they, everything they represent is entirely quote-unquote politically correct, or they are, or we are just, we are just uh, embracing every value that we think is, uh, it's, it's kosher, as both Catherine and, uh, and also Lucy have pointed out, there are so many issues with gender and sexuality in the film that nowadays we may not be, uh, necessarily consider them as really politically palatable to use, um, to use an edible term. Um, his father, I do want to point out, however, is that his father Itami Mansaku um, worked before um, the war. I would say worked. He died in 1946, I think. And he was, um, Mansaku, basically his father was a political satirist and also a Nikazu director. And he, and he was one of those political satirists who managed to get through the militarist period unharmed. However, he was really, really um, hypercritical in the 1940s, especially when the US occupation decided to condone the emperor from any war guilt. And Itami Mansaku, the father, actually was really daring at one point. He said that he, here in Japan, everyone thinks that um, everyone thinks that they are not responsible for the war. You go to ask a clerk in, in the city hall, they say that, well, I'm not responsible. You ask your teacher, I'm not responsible. You ask your neighbor, I'm not, not responsible. You ask the military, they say that I'm not responsible. Well, it, and then Ma, it, Itami Mansaku uh, said, said that, well, in this case, someone, someone got to be responsible for this war, right? Shall we say that this is the emperor? Oh my God, how dare I say that? Of course, the emperor is not responsible. And so, so, he, so Itami Mansaku was really daring before his death, really pointing out the fundamental problem with the post-war political system in Japan was that no one was held responsible for the war. And that why, that's why in some way the idea is that how in Japan that kind of situation could be, um, could be, uh, could be rectified, especially under the kind of Cold War um, atmosphere. Now, Itami Tsuto himself was considered a prodigy, and so um, he was admitted during the war into uh, a specialist high school called uh, Matsuyana Higashi High School, and, but he didn't get good grades. Um, he, he was interested in languages and cultures instead of the sciences, so he didn't really get good grades, but he actually became a really talented translator and, of course, actor. Um, he actually befriended a very important figure, um, the, the Nobel Prize, Literary Prize winner, or later on Nobel Prize winner, Oe Kenzaburo. And, um, and they actually, Oe Kenzaburo actually married his, uh, married Itami Zuto's sister. And so um, it's a very interesting thing that um, in the 1960s, he worked with one of the most left-wing um, film directors in Japan, Oshima Nagisa, um, on a film called Nihon, Sh uh, Nihon, Shunk uh, Nihon Shunko, or Sing a Song for Sex. And so this is a really interesting film in a way that he actually, Itami Tuzo was working with his soon-to-be wife, uh, Miyamoto uh, Nobuko. And, um, and it's very interesting to make that connection because 
Uh, Oshima Nagisa's film is really about bawdy songs, basically sexually charged songs that were sung by the working class. And so the idea is that somehow I think the left-wing activists and artists from that generation really associated the open and direct expression of sexuality, the kind of um, unhindered um, and kind of quote unquote uncultured, um, uncultivated way of kind of expressing sexuality and the directness with kind of, with the kind of working class beauty or ethics. And so sometimes as we can under, as we can imagine, sometimes these body songs or these kind of sexual energy and sexual intensity was very misogynistic. And even during Oshima time, I think Oshima's wife sometimes complained that, yes, you think that this is such a revolutionary gesture to be able to sing sex songs in the public and to be able to express your sexuality without any hindrance, without any kind of moral constraints by the kind of conservative society. You think that that's a liberation, but it's not a liberation for women. So I think even it, at those time, I think the, the women who were working closely together, creating some of these works together with people like Oshima and uh, Itami Tuto actually uh, were hyper aware of that, were really critical of that kind of issues. And um, he actually worked in um, his first, he actually also worked in a very beautiful film called um, um, Family Game, or in Japanese it's called uh, Kazoku Gameu, and by Morita Yoshimitsu. And a lot of people actually associate the kind of humor, uh, the kind of quirky humor we are seeing in Tampopo from Morita's film. Again, very episodic. Um, it circles around one single thread, which in at that case, a tutor who happens to be extremely handsome and everyone desires him. And, um, but at the same time, it's actually padded with a lot of different vignettes and episodes that deals with kind of desire and uh, family ugliness and ickiness in some ways. Um, now, one thing that um, is really important to remember is that after the war, Japanese politics was pretty much dominated by the Liberal Democratic Party, to some extent it is, it is still very much dominated by the Liberal Democratic Party. The LDP is actually uh, composed of a lot of, or used to be composed of a lot of politicians who actually survived the war, uh, but were actually descendants or direct members from the militarist factions in the in politics. So it's a pretty right-wing political party. They worked closely with the Yakuza, I wouldn't say they, but like a lot of them. And so um, and so the idea is that the main thing that the LDP was really pushing forward, especially in the 80s, was a revival of a of an ideology, ideological or a, a, a belief called uh, the Hon Chin Long. The Hon Chin Long is basically the theory of being Japanese. And so um, you can say there's a kind of Japanese exceptionalism. And the idea of Nihon Jinlon was a, uh, was, an, was a concept that was interestingly invented by colonial settlers, the Dutch colonial settlers and later American colonial settlers who actually saw Japan as an exception. But then that idea of Japanese exceptionalism was then internalized by a lot of Japanese philosophers and scholars throughout the 19th century and later on into the 20th century that eventually fueled extreme nationalism and definitely militarism in the 1930s and 1940s. Now in post-war Japan in, internally, the Nihon Jinlon kind of lost its support in the 1950s and 1960s. It was kind of replaced by the very kind of 50s and 60s, very American brand of liberal but quite conservative um, hum form of humanism. It's like, oh, we are all humans and we all suffer. We, 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 we all understand each other. And no matter how left-wing, now this, was like, this idea was actually very much attacked by the left-wing activists and artists in the 60s, but no matter how much they attacked it, because they were educated in the 1950s under humanism, you can still sense the kind of humanistic kind of tendency 
even in Itami's work. Um, and um, the, other th the other thing that the LDP also wanted to push forward was that Japan's success, of course, according to the conservative, the Japanese conservative was that, well, because this is part of our national character or kokumense or minzokuse. The idea is that we have this particular Japanese hard working ethics, whatever. And not only that, and the LDP argues is that we have walk on your side, which is the idea is that we have a Japanese soul basically bought the technologies and talents from the West, so to speak. And so, so in Tom Pop, we can say that Itami Tsuto is very uncomfortable with many of these ideas. So on the one hand, um, and we can say that, for example, Tom Paul Paul's success story, if you just take it out on his own, it's a very, it can be, it can kind of fall into the trap of becoming a very typical Nihon Jinmon story, right? A woman who is being looked down upon by other people and then somehow, somehow it creates a sense of success. But then um, Itami is also kind of very clever in a way that Laman, um, and the film keeps referring to the origin, the ethnic origin of Laman, the idea that the Japanese version of Laman was largely brought uh, from China. And so in one scene, for example, they talk about how to go to these Chinese cooks and also chefs to, to steal recipes. And, um, and so the idea is already kind of making some kind of changes um, in some of these success story. And also the idea is that um, uh, the second thing is that um, the idea, the success story in this case, however, is not a middle class person becoming a successful business person or a, an already rich person trying to struggle towards something higher. We are really talking about, uh, and if you look at Japanese television at that time, there was there were a lot of stories about indeed very working class, pretty well-to-do people who, who are trying to struggle through the kind of bubble economy system and become like very successful business people and become international koksai, like become like um, a part of the international community. Tampopo has that, but then it is a working class character. And again, I'm not saying that this is totally kosher, it has its own problem, but the idea is that uh, Tom Popo is from the working class. It is surrounded by many working class people. And it has a very specific sequence in which they go to all of these rough sleepers and talk to them. And then they teach, they turn out to be connoisseur of uh, beautiful food. And they all have interesting backgrounds. And interestingly, if we think closely, they are all people who are being marginalized and kicked out of the bubble economy. They probably used to have really good jobs, like in order to acquire that kind of taste. And so it's almost like the, forgot, the, the forgotten people. And in terms of the working class ethics, we can also pay attention to the fact that unlike many Japanese contemporary drama that was set in the 1980s, um, we would notice that the entire film didn't take place in central Tokyo. There was no scene that takes place in central Tokyo. There is a very, interesting thing that every place that we see are in the suburbs, they are crisscrossed by the railway system, which is a sign of the suburban landscape around Tokyo or in, in, the, in the greater Tokyo area. And so um, many of the uh, things, even like I, re I remember that when a gangster was being killed, it's not a beautiful park with some kind of romantic setting. It's a very kind of down to earth neighborhood um, not a nice neighborhood, kind of like a very, very, very basic neighborhood kind of uh, children playground. And um, the other thing, and the film definitely does talk about sex and food. And, um, and this particular point, um, a lot of people in Asia refers to the idea of Confucianism. In Confucianism, um, there is one famous um, phrase raised by Confucius, which is 
sex and food are the nature of human beings. And so the idea is that, um, the, the idea is that, well, we, if you want to define what it means by being human, sex and food. And so now, and I would comment on it a little bit more um, um, in, in, in a couple of minutes, but the idea is that um, the focus on sex and food, once again, is very much coming from Oshima Nagisa's understanding of the working class or their understanding of the working class idea, the profound desire of human beings for this group of directors, they feel that they want something dirty and, and, and dis disgusting. And the idea is that something that is, that is really uncomfortable because for them, I'm not saying that this is really the case, like the working class is not supposed to be afraid. They don't, they're not bound by middle-class ethics to be afraid of dealing with disgusting things. Now, once again, a lot of people do point out, especially in the 19s and 2000s point out, well, this is of course, a middle, this is in itself a middle-class fantasy um, that the working class don't care about these things. But, uh, but this is the kind of, imagination from that generation of left-wing filmmakers. Um, women, um, and, and of course, um, Catherine has talked a lot about gender representation, so I'm not going to repeat that. I do want to say uh, in that regard is that uh, Itami Tsuto later on did uh, feature his wife, uh, once again, Miyamoto Nobuko, in many, many films, including three very famous films called Taxing Women. And precisely, I think he his wife became critical of his representation of women in Tampopo. And so his wife took um, the kind of like, took a really active creative seat to really try to rewrite Itami's representation of women in some of his later films. Um, again, I'm not saying that it's it would it then becomes totally pro uh, unproblematic. There are still many issues in those representations, and I think one thing, uh, a couple of a couple of things I would like to point out is that uh, the film is really careful in terms of asking us to understand 1980s Japan precisely as a place where. Um, the LDP is trying to tell us about wakon yosai, which is like Japanese soul and, and quote unquote Western technology. But the idea, the, the delineation between where do we begin to see that this is, oh, this is real Japanese uh, uh, cultural values. These are real European values. I think the film is trying to really demythologize that kind of differentiation. And I think the most delightful scene that does it brilliantly is the kind of spaghetti scene, <laughs> which I love the idea is that, um, although it does have the problem of trying to cultivate women, but it's also very critical of it. It's like, well, these women are asked to behave in a certain way. Again, many of these women presumably would be wealthier middle-class, uh, women who were probably married to uh, very successful business businessmen, and they want to learn. They wanted to learn these things because they they might have the chance to go to America to go to Europe. Yeah, and um, and so this is a really interesting point. The other thing I, I would say from a uh, from an Asian philosoph philosophical point of view, I would say that. Confucianism, some, even though Confuci in Confucianism, it says that sex and food are nature. Um, a lot of these directors somehow overlook the fact that Confucius does talk about, well, how do we actually uh, find a middle ground in our desire for food and um, our regulation of nature? I think that's probably, Victor, a really terrific point, actually, to open up to discussion, because I, I think we've kind of, between us, just covered so much ground. And I, I'm sort of wondering, how do we find a middle ground? Like, where is the meeting point? And one of the questions that I wanted to throw open to both of you is whether you, taking all of this into account, um, I suppose I have two questions. One is, do you think that this is a film that is pushing or positing a kind of ethics of filmmaking and film viewing, either through revulsion or through its political and um, 
and generic fusions. I mean, we haven't talked very much about the way that you use that phrase Japanese soul with Western technology. I kept thinking maybe the film is a Japanese soul that's in a Western genre because it, it draws so much, not only on the Western, but also I think there are moments of Chaplin and of the rom-com and of the melodrama with the makeover. So that was my first question. And then my second question is, thinking about Cavell and Emerson, as I want to do, there's, you know, there's this phrase from Emerson, which I'm slightly butchering, but effectively amounts to, we always have to think about where we're standing when we look at something. And to what extent do we think this is a film that kind of throws open all sorts of different aspects to different kinds of viewers. So maybe Lucy, if I could ask you those questions first, feel free to answer either or both. Thank you. I mean, I think both hugely important points and I'll, I'll be um, as succinct as possible. In relation to where we're standing, I think that's really important. And I was aware of that the whole time thinking, um, I mean, one of the issues about um, grounding a, a, an ethics or, or aesthetics of disgust in bodily responses is whether or not is the condition, is, is the question of universality, and whether or not there's something kind of about the human, human person who is repulsed by certain things or how culturally prescribed that is also temporarily I mean I'm very acutely aware of if that film was made as we talked about as Victor said so clearly if it was made today there would be lots that wouldn't be able to be in that film now so when it's made as well as where and as well as who we are all makes a huge difference to our response clearly always and I do think I'm fascinated by this um, knowledge that you've imparted, Victor, about the um, filmmakers' attempt to kind of undermine, I sense that definitely, that idea of sort of pricking and teasing and, and, and making fun at, but the, the use, and also the, the idea of the Raman Western as opposed to the spaghetti Western is absolutely fantastic, using the charging tanker with the bull, with the horns on it, rather than the charging horses, the assembly of the group of men, like the um, Magnificent Seven, obviously Seven Samurai, but like the, the transposing, the blending of these genres and the music, of course, hugely important. The, the blending of these music performance styles but, and everything. and all the lovely irises in and whites yes. and those kind of very old fashioned, amazing, yeah. and formal devices. Uh, and I think um, the the uh, the idea that the the gangster says at the beginning, you know, the film show that I'm really looking forward to is that final film show that as as I die. And then when we get to it at the end, and he does, he says, like, this is my final film show, and it's great. It's about what I would say really disgusting food stuff, like you know, a hog eating some kind of yam, the killing, hunting, killing the hog, ripping open the yam to eat the wonderful. I mean that's that's disgusting <laughs> and, and so you know there's, there's this incredible completely consistent um blending all the way through and I, and I think in that way it's, it's really quite a, a a masterly um tease yeah I would say um <clears throat> in 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 response to that I would say um when I watched the film I think right from the beginning, um, especially I have to say that scene when they have the fight in the beginning. And also the scene, um, I would say there are two moments uh, that came into mind, which refers to the films of Kurosawa Akira. And, and it's very interesting because, because Kurosawa Akira was indeed really well known to have used the uh, American Western as a generic framework and then he puts a lot of cool things in it or some sometimes even Shakespearean drama and so but the idea is that um I think it's very interesting in a way that um the the fight scene for example we are seeing a very a lot of generic conventions that we can see from the American Western definitely which was also have already been used a lot in the 50s and 40s and 50s by Kurosawa. But I also love the moment, which is a very Kurosawa moment. It's the idea that when the when Goro and all the people go out to the open, let's go out to the open and they all get out, the camera stay on a kind of slightly high angle. And then we see Tampopo and the kid just ducking down. And we're seeing the spectator of the spectacle instead of the spectacle, which is a very, very, very Kurosawa moment. 
And the very beginning, when the, when we see the truck in the very beginning in black and white, it's it really harks back to um, some of the films, like even Scandal, like in the beginning from Kurosawa. And so I think um, it is indeed a very interesting moment. And in some ways, I think in the 1980s into the 1990s, a lot of Japanese directors were really concerned about because the Japanese industry was doing so badly. They all, many people looked back to Ozu and it's like, wow, look, this is like the most Japanese thing we had, that has ever been created. And I think Itami is really trying to resist that. It's, it's trying to say that we can do something better. We can invent, mix different things together and do something new about it. Um, and just super, super quickly, I'm going to be really economical about this because I think, um, Lucy, I love Lucy's comment about the uh, the poor soft turtle. Um, it it is actually one of those really. I have to. I agree with this really disgusting and uncomfortable delight, <laughs> like, like being enjoyed by. I really upper. thought you were going to say it's really really delicious. I'm almost. <laughs> 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 no, I've never tried it. I'm vegetarian. Then <laughs> I'm a Buddhist. And but the idea is that um, they it's an upper class um, delicacy, and and again it it's such a critical moment. I think the idea is oh, it's upper class delicacy, mm. and everyone watches and and including Tambovo, which is really and they oh we call it a wild one, yeah. awful. And he yeah. then bestows his noodle chef upon yeah. Tampopo to help her. So mm. they, um, again, there's this very, very quite brilliant uh, satire mm. of the mores of, you know, actually she really needs the noodle chef, but yeah. nobody, nobody needs to eat freshly mm. murdered with one strike soft shell turtle, that's preposterous. So I think that there's a wonderful kind of pillaring of, of upper class, like the, the businessman in the, um, in the restaurant. And I love, I hadn't, I watched it again yesterday. I'd forgotten that they're all bright red. When, when the camera pans around the table, they're all so embarrassed and humiliated by the young man who's out ordered them, they are shown up they are absolutely um, uh, red faced. But anyway, we, I think we've said it We're enough. coming to time, but I just wanted to kind of leave one last question and then we'll have to wrap up, um, which is to do with whether we can flip the ethics of disgust on its head and talk about an ethics of playfulness instead, because it seems to me that, you know, that final death scene does take place in a playground with that bright red ceramic pig next to the mm. gangster, that there is a lightness to the film, that it skips between all of these different positions and takes and maybe there's a you know there's something political and ethical to be found in that idea of play I think it's ambivalence I think that that's its strength is that precisely that it flits between playfulness and horror in some ways attraction and repulsion sexiness and disgust I think it's it, it it's a slalom yeah for me. <laughs> thank you thank you both so much. Victor, did you want to say anything to that before we wrap up? I would just uh, say really quickly that, um, yeah, playfulness and humour are the signature of Itami Tsuto and also what got him into trouble. <laughs> um, and later on, he was being forced to commit suicide. Um, so in some ways, I think, Catherine, you're absolutely right on. The idea is that playfulness, uh, the fact that he was being killed eventually by the Yakuza because of him being playful about them says something about how people are unable to take playfulness as a criticism. But uh, by the same token, I would say that, um, I would say that the, yeah, I would say that I would wish, uh, I would wish the gender aspect a little bit more, <laughs> um, a, more a little bit more serious. Uh, there are more serious confrontation discussions about the gender series as, as gender issues as well. Um, well, thank you both so, so thank much you. for um, participating in the discussion. I think we did it justice online. Um, <laughs> so much more to say. But I know. Stop, yeah. <laughs> and I've had a lovely time. We'll have to continue it at another moment. Um, Thank you to anyone that's at home watching this for um, <laughs> taking the time. And just uh, before we close, a reminder that we will be back in person, very excitingly, for the next Philosophical Screens, which takes place, I think I'm right in saying, on February the 10th. Yes. 
um, when Lucy and I um, will, will have the pleasure of discussing François Truffaut's masterpiece of the new wave, uh, Jules et Jim, with Professor Fiona Handyside, Fiona Handyside of Exeter University. So we're both immensely looking forward to that and to hopefully seeing many of you in person. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You.